first I'll give you a little introduction and then we will talk for the majority of today about relative supersaturation or RSS. Um, what is RSS? How do we measure RSS? Um, and how can we influence RSS with nutrition? We will also talk about some common misconceptions in RSS and of course I will talk about other methods that you can use to assess stone risk. So first things first, why would we assess stone risk in nutrition? Um, so um, Dr. Bria Severin, um, a French man actually, um, said something very, very wise. Um, he, he was not just a doctor, by the way. He was a biologist, he was a lawyer, and he absolutely loved food. Um, and he said, tell me what you eat and I tell you what you are. Um, and, and this is true for humans. I mean, it's becoming more and more popular and people are saying this to each other every single day, but it's even more true for our pets because our pets eat a less varied diet than we do. Um, you know, often they eat the same kibbles day in, day out. And it is really important that the diet is safe, complete and balanced for them. And this means that when you work at a pet food company like us, you need to sort of predict what will happen in the real world if an animal eats the food that you make. So you need to predict the real world situations basically in a controlled research study. Um, and, and here at Royal Canin, the way we do that for stone risk is we assess RSS. So Amory just gave an amazing lecture about how you assess the stone risk in your clinics. And I'm sure that you guys do it almost on a daily basis. So you take a really good history, you take into account the breed of animal, the age, the urine pH, the USG. But in a research setting, we are always dealing with healthy animals. And healthy animals, they're physiologically often different to diseased animals. So that makes it a little bit more tricky. And we, we have to rely on certain factors. Um, the factors that we rely on in, in urinary stone risk assessment would be the concentrations of the different solvents in the urine that can all combine together and, and thereby form a crystal or a stone. Um, and the interactions that are possible between these solvents. And um, Amory really gave the perfect introduction for this because the concentration of the solvents mostly relies on urine dilution. So that's actually relatively simple if you think about it that way. Um, but of course the concentration also relies on the ingredients or the nutrients that you have in the food. So the concentrations of the precursors of these solvents. Um, and additionally, the urine pH can really affect how these solvents can interact with one another. And taking all these different factors into account, their concentration and their interactions, that is what relative supersaturation is. So this is a slide where I try to sort of introduce the different states of saturation to you. So on the left, you have a cup of coffee. And the cup of coffee, when you make it, it's undersaturated for sugar. And then you start adding the sugar, um, and the sugar will dissolve. And it will dissolve, and it will dissolve, and it will dissolve. So the coffee was undersaturated for sugar. Then in the middle, you have um, an iced tea. And the iced tea is quite sweet. And if you would add sugar to this iced tea, then the sugar would not dissolve because there's already so much sugar in there. So the iced tea is saturated with sugar. And on the right, you have a, a can of Coke. And in the can of Coke, if you open it, you hear which is the carbon dioxide escaping. Um, and actually, this can of Coke, before the carbon dioxide escaped, was super saturated with carbon dioxide. Um, so these are sort of the states that the urine can be in. It can be undersaturated, so you know you have a lot of calcium floating around and a lot of oxalate floating around, but not enough to ever form a stone. You have a lot of magnesium floating around and phosphate, but not enough to ever um, uh, get together and form a struvite stone. It can be saturated, which could get a little bit tricky if you add extra to the mix, or it can be super saturated, which would be a dangerous situation, potentially. So what is RSS? The definition of RSS, if you put it simply, is just the potential of the urine to form crystals. And relative means that the numerical result is a ratio, um, and supersaturation means that the amount of the dissolved substance exceeds the normal capacity. 
And overall, RSS is a formula. So the formula is between, uh, well, you divide the activity product, which is simply the different ions that can interact with one another to become a crystal or a stone, by the solubility product, which is um, the, the maximum level um, or, or at which this stone will dissolve. And the formation product is the moment when there will actually be a stone formation or a crystal formation. And if the formation product equals the activity product, then that will induce crystallization. So this is the highest concentration in a solution before precipitation occurs. So like I just said, the solubility product is the level at which a solute dissolves in a solution. And the higher the solubility product, the more soluble the substance will be. So this probably all means nothing to you, yeah? You work in general practice, most of you, and you think, what am I going to do with this formula in my general practice? So we will talk about that a little bit later. But first, how do we measure all this? Well, at Royal Cannon and at other pet food companies, they do similar things, although the protocols will be slightly different. Um, we, we do actual feeding trials, where we feed a diet for at least seven days to a dog or a cat, um, all the dogs involved in the feeding trials at Royal Cannon are small breed dogs because they're at higher risk of developing the stones in the first place. And after that, we collect their urine for three days straight. All this urine is pulled together, and on this pool, we measure the different ions that can be involved in the formation of all the different stones that are out there. So that would be calcium, magnesium, and sodium. Um, it would be ammonium, oxalate, potassium, phosphate, sulfate, citrate, and uric acid. And all these numbers, we, we plug them in what I call a black box. It's almost magical. It's called SuperSats, and it's a software that contains an algorithm that was uh, developed by Dr. Robertson in the 1960s. And SuperSats understands how these different ions can interact with one another, and it takes that all into account to predict the risk of stone formation. So up here you can see the two formulas for the two most important stones that are out there, the most prevalent stones for struvite and calcium oxalate. And you can see that struvite, the activity product, contains of magnesium, ammonium, and phosphate, and you divide it by the solubility product. And for calcium oxalate, it is from calcium and oxalate divided by the calcium oxalate solubility product. And if the outcome of this formula is less than one, then you would say this urine is undersaturated. If it is equal to one, it's saturated, so then it's the iced tea. And if it's over than one, then it's super saturated, so then you would have your can of Coke. So I have a few slides to talk about this concept because I, I know how complex it is, and actually when I settled in my job, it took me a good three months to understand RSS. So explaining it to you in 40 minutes is almost impossible. So it's sort of repeat, 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 but trying to explain it to you in different ways. So over here on this graph, you can see th the three zones again. So you can see the treatment and prevention zone, the undersaturated zone, the metastable supersaturation zone in the middle, which would be the prevention zone. So uh, a stone will, will likely not form if you have urine in this zone. Um, and then the danger zone, the labile supersaturation zone. And for calcium oxalate and for struvite, the actual output values for RSS are slightly different on these zones. So for both of them, if they're below one, they're undersaturated. So that would be treatment and prevention. But the danger zone for calcium oxalate starts at 12, and for struvite, it starts at 2.5. So they're quite different from one another. And here is the activity product and the solubility product situation again. So remember that the RSS formula is the activity product divided by the solubility product. If you're in the metastable supersaturation zone, then the activity product is greater than the solubility product. And if you're in the label supersaturation zone, that means your activity product has met the formation product. So the activity product at that point is greater than the formation product. So in the clinics, this means that in the undersaturated stone zone, a new struvite uroliths will not form, and neither will new calcium oxalate uroliths. If there is an existing struvite urolith, it will dissolve as long as you address the, the urinary tract infection that often goes hand in hand with it. 
And I did the calcium oxalate one, Smiley, a little bit later because unfortunately we still don't know how to dissolve calcium oxalate. If there's anyone in the audience here who has a good idea, then come to me and we can work together because I would love to be able to do that. But at the moment we can just say that if, there's an un if calcium oxalate is in the undersaturated zone, then an existing stone will not grow, which is already pretty good. If we're in a metastable zone, then a new struvite urolith will not form, and neither will new calcium oxalate urolith. But if there already is one, then it may actually grow. And in the case of struvite, it will likely not dissolve. Yeah? So then you're already entering this stage where you think, mm, RSS is actually a little bit too high. And the danger zone, well, that's just stone disaster, because then struvite stones will form, calcium oxalate stones will form, and you definitely do not want to be there. So now, how can we influence RSS with nutrition? Um, actually, it's simple, really. Um, we can do two different things. We can decrease the concentration of the solutes in the urine, so we can do that by diluting the urine. So we need to increase the water intake. You just heard a lot about that. Or you can limit the amount excreted. Um, and that means that you need to limit the precursors that are present in the food. The other way to do it is to modify the chemical form of the precursors in the urine. And in, this mostly works for struvite, but in that case, if you, if you modify the urinary pH, then you can modify the chemical form of the precursors. So decreasing RSS in general. If the, dilute, if the urine is more dilute, then the RSS will be lower. So it's, it's simple and you know, we've just been through it in an entire lecture, so I'm not going to talk about it in detail at this point, but ways to decrease or ways to increase the water intake would either be to feed a wet diet or officially, scientifically speaking, a diet that has over 73% in moisture. You can make water more attractive. I'm sure that you discuss things like making the water taste nicer by um, you know, poaching some chicken and, and feeding the chicken water, for example, or giving a water fountain to cats. And um, the way that we do it for the dry foods, um, at Royal Cannon in particular, but at some other pet food companies as well, is do give a high sodium dry diet. And we will go through these options. So first of all, wet food. A typical loaf wet food is about 75% water. So that's already pretty, pretty good. Um, if you give chunks in gravy, then the water percentage is even higher and it's approximately 80% water. So the thing that you need to keep in mind is that if you do mixed feeding, so if you feed a wet diet and a dry diet, then you're actually diluting that's maybe the wrong word in this situation, but the effect of how much water are you giving? Because if you're giving a wet diet as 75% water, but it's only 50% of what the animal eats, and you give a dry diet, which is 8% water, and that's the other 50%, then you suddenly end up with a diet that is only approximately 40% water. And in that case, it's not going to decrease the RSS significantly anymore. So this is a mistake that I made when I was working in practice. I said, as long as they're eating wet food, we're already getting there, but actually they need to eat a lot of wet food, mostly wet food, or you need to do something with the dry food in order to increase the water intake in that case as well. So a nice rule of thumb for the dry food would be that you give, for every cup of kibbles that you give, you give two cups of water and you mix it in there. Um, this could work well if the owners want to give a particular dry food because there is a different pathology going on. Um, or if you have those animals that don't like the texture of wet food, then you can give this a shot. Um, and this is a difficult calculation that I've written down in the notes, but I don't have my notes here. But overall, if you add two cups of water to one cup of kibbles, then you will reach the, the, the moisture percentage that you, need to, that you need to reach. So then in particular about struvite RSS. So um, this, is a, this is a graph um, that I took from a scientific paper where they fed is it four? Yes, four different levels of moisture food to cats. And what they found in this paper, and this is really interesting, is if you feed the dry food, so that's the one completely on the left there, 6.3%, 
If you increase the water in the food up to 53% in this case, then the cat will voluntarily decrease how much they drink. So they do this compensation mechanism. Um, so if you feed a, a diet that is higher in water, up to a certain point, they will decrease their drinking until they drink almost nothing. And it's not until you reach this magical 73% moisture mark that this compensatory mechanism is sort of overruled because the total water intake will already be greater. And this same study found that for struvite RSS, if the dietary moisture level was over 73%, then the struvite RSS was indeed significantly lower compared to the other diets. And uh, the same is true for calcium oxalate RSS, although there are differences between species and there are differences between breeds. Um, but in this study here on the left, so that's the same study in cats, they also measured the calcium oxalate RSS. And again, for the food that was 73% moisture, the calcium oxalate RSS was significantly lower. For dogs, it's a bit more complex. So the study that you can see here on the right, you can see Labrador retrievers, big dogs, don't very often form calcium oxalate stones. Struvite stones do happen because of their urinary tract infections that they're more likely to get. But in the case of calcium oxalate RSS for Labrador retrievers, this study did not actually find a significant difference between the different moisture levels. Um, however, it was a small study and you can see a little dip, so there may be something there. However, for the miniature schnauzers, a breed that is quite likely to get calcium oxalate stones, you can see a significant decrease in calcium oxalate RSS with an increase in moisture in the diet. So now on to sodium. So the next few uh, slides, I've copied them all from an abstract session that Jan Keo, who is sitting over there, um, uh, presented at ACVIM in 2015. Um, so he did a really really useful study where he compared the different sodium levels in, in diets and looked at the effects of those sodium levels on water intake, on urine volume, on struvite RSS, on calcium oxalate RSS. And overall, the general conclusion was if you increase the sodium, they become more thirsty, so they drink more. If they drink more, then you have an increased urine volume. If they have an increased urine volume, you have a decreased urine-specific gravity and you therefore have urine dilution and lower calcium oxalate and struvite RSS. So it's a study done in both dogs and cats, cats on the left and dogs on the right. And here you can just see the water intake. So these animals were fed a dry food and with the increasing levels of sodium, you can see an increase in water intake. And this translates directly onto the struvite RSS. So this is the same diet, the same study, and you can see with an increased level of sodium over time, you can see a nice decrease in struvite RSS in both dogs and cats. And this was highly significant. The same is true for calcium oxalate RSS. So if you increase the levels of sodium in a diet, again, this is the same dogs and cats in the same study you can have this significant decrease in calcium oxalate RSS as well. So, I mean, as a vet in practice, I didn't quite understand RSS, then I needed to get to grips with it when I started in my current role, but actually, if you summarize it like this, it's simple, yeah? Urine dilution, decrease the precursors, and you're already most of the way there. So the other parts of it would be decreasing the RSS by targeted precursors of these, um, of these crystals and the stones in the urine. So by targeted dietary minerals. And in the case of struvite, it's actually relatively simple. So struvite is composed of ammonium, magnesium, and phosphorus. And actually what we found out with studies over the years is that if you, a risk factor for the development of struvite, first of all, it's of course urinary tract infections and an increase in pH, but second of all, if you have a higher dietary phosphorus and a higher dietary magnesium, then you have a higher excretion in the urine of the phosphorus and the magnesium, and that increases the risk of struvite. Calcium oxalate is not as straightforward. So this is a slide with a lot of words. I won't go into too much detail because we probably don't have the time for that, 
But um, dietary calcium, overall, we say we recommend a moderate level. And the reason we recommend a moderate level is because calcium interacts with just about everything. So if you have a low dietary calcium, which you would think makes sense because calcium oxalate, but then because calcium actually also binds oxalate in the gut, you could have a higher oxalate absorption. So you could theoretically then still increase your risk. If you then think, okay, no, I don't want this high uh, oxalate absorption, let's increase the calcium, you'll have a high calcium absorption. So again, you could increase the risk. And then there are loads of other nutrients that will affect this. So nutrients could be phosphorus, so the calcium phosphorus in the ratio in the diet makes sense, vitamin D, fat could affect it. And the source of calcium or the bioavailability of calcium also makes a difference. So there would be a difference between vegetable proteins which also contain a lot of oxalate that could bind it, and animal proteins, although they could contain a lot of phosphorus. So it's, a, it's, it's very, very tricky. And then in the terms of dietary oxalate, unfortunately, there's no good correlation between the level of dietary oxalate and um, the urinary excretion of dietary oxalate. So you may remember your statistics from way back in vet school, and R squared is, uh, is a value that tells you how much the correlation actually means something. And if an R squared is below 0.7, you would just laugh it away. And on this graph, you can see an R squared of 0.09. So there's absolutely no correlation between dietary oxalate and the, and the oxalate excretion in the urine. And the reason that probably is, is because oxalate, like calcium, is influenced by so many different things. So first of all, it's in all these different plant ingredients. And then when it's in the gut, it will interact with other minerals like calcium, like magnesium. And then the microbiome in the gut can also do stuff with oxalate. So there are actually bacteria in the gut that can break down oxalate. And if you have loads more of those bacteria, it could be possible you absorb less, although this is being researched in humans at the moment. But I feel it's quite likely. And then after absorption has occurred, not just of oxalate, but also of precursors of oxalate, then there is also metabolism inside, and endogenous precursors can then create oxalate that is excreted in the urine. So then, urinary pH. So you, you will probably have questions about oxalate, calcium oxalate and urinary pH, and I'll get to that in a common misconception slide. And actually, what I try to come bring across with this slide is for struvite, urinary pH is super important. And the reason why it's so important is because it, it, it's in French, because I copied this from a French textbook. But um, on, on, on this graph, you see ammonium, magnesium, and phosphorus. And the phosphorus can actually interact with hydrogen. So if you have a very acidic pH, there's a lot of hydrogen floating around, and that will all be bound to the phosphorus. And the phosphorus is not available to form struvite. If the urine becomes more alkaline, then the phosphorus becomes more available. So a more alkaline urine really is a risk factor for struvite formation. And this is a study that very beautifully showed this. So in this study, 30 cats were randomized to three diets. And the diets, they differed in magnesium content, so one of the precursors and in their pH. And the basal diet was a diet with a normal magnesium content, but a relatively alkaline pH. And already with that diet, you could see struvite crystals happening in the cats. And actually one of the cats was clinical and developed hematuria. If you did a basal diet with added magnesium oxide, which meant that you increased the magnesium, but you also increased the pH, that was true trouble. And one cat on the study actually blocked. However, if you increase the magnesium content of the diet, but you acidified the diet to a pH of 5.7 in the urine, nothing happened. So pH and urine dilution, super important. Precursors are important, but you need to look at it in the light of all the other factors combined together. So now you're saying, okay, so you've been talking about RSS, you've been talking about these research studies, how does this translate to my practice? Um, so the clinical connection between RSS and stones is 
unfortunately, maybe for you, quite easy to prove in vitro. And this is why I'm showing you this study because it was, it was really, really good. What was done was they pooled urine samples of two different diets. Diet A had an RSS of 0.2 and diet B had an RSS of 0.4, so twice as high. And then they took struvite stones that were from actual clinical cases and were the same size, weight, and shape. And they put the stones in these urines and just followed them over time to see what happened. And what happened was that both stones dissolved, because remember, RSS was below one, so they would dissolve. But this dissolution on diet B, with an RSS that was twice as high, took 50% more time than the dissolution on diet A. So this means that the lower you go, the quicker stone dissolution will go, also in your clinical cases. So if you're dealing with an animal with a struvite stone, you can't do enough to make them drink, 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 increase their moisture intake. Just try it all because the more dilute, the quicker it will happen. In vivo studies have also been performed for struvite. And in, in one of these studies, they compared two diets. Um, at this point, we already knew that a struvite RSS below one would dissolve a stone. So it was decided to still to not um, to not have struvite RSSs that would be higher than that. Um, and there was a dry diet with an RSS of 0.2, which was achieved with added salt, and a wet diet with an RSS of 0.3. And 21 cats entered the study, and they were fed these diets according to their preference. And what was found was that in 17 cats, the stones completely dissolved. And the four leftover cats, they had surgery, and it turned out that their stones were calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate. And as I said, we still don't know how to dissolve those. Stone dissolution on average took 18 days in these cats, and there was no significant difference between the diets. So I put the table down here, um, and, and what you can see that on the dry diet, the dissolution took approximately 19 days, and on the wet diet, 16 days, but this was not significantly different from one another. So then the clinical connection for calcium oxalate. Will we ever be able to dissolve calcium oxalate? And I hope so, but today we cannot. And in human medicine, they try, and they're not managing either. Um, so if the vets get there first, that would be great, of course. But at the moment, we say treatment relies on surgical removal followed by prevention. And prevention, again, in the same way. So dilute the urine decrease the precursors, yeah? And commercial diets in general, they aim to decrease the calcium oxalate RSS. Um, but unfortunately, prospective studies for calcium oxalate are quite difficult to do because you need a really long follow-up after the surgery has been performed and there will be a lot of dropouts, clients that don't come back to the clinic because they've moved away, the animals develop a different disease. So at the moment, we have to rely on data that is a little bit Less strong than for struvite, but nonetheless, pretty good. Because there was a prospective study that looked at urinary diets in cats and showed the benefits of the urinary diet, although the RSS was not performed in a research setting, so we don't know anything about the RSS. However, this retrospective study that I'm showing you here is a study that compared the Royal Canin urinary SO diet, so we know the RSS for that, which was diet A, with two other diets, a different urinary diet from a different pet food company and um, any homemade diet grouped together. And what you could see is that on the urinary SO diet, which we know has a low RSS, the recurrence was a lot lower than on the other diets. So the recurrence was approximately 24%, um, but it took up to 5.6 years for this recurrence to happen on average. However, if they have a diet that we know from our research facilities are likely to have a higher RSS value, the recurrence happened quicker, 59%. On average, after 2.1 years, the stone was back. So now on to the common misconceptions in RSS. And um, we just got a question already about feeding a urinary diet long term. Is it safe? 
So lots of research studies have been published. I put the references at the bottom uh, on purpose so that you could see that people have really published these studies and done these studies and done them properly. And in healthy dogs and cats, there is no evidence that this sodium level in the diet that we do in urinary diets is harmful. So short-term studies, mid-term studies, and long-term studies, the longest study being two years, have been performed. And things that you would worry about with sodium in humans, such as blood pressure, cardiac function, renal function, none of that was affected at all. So we can say, yes, high sodium diets are safe if an animal is healthy, apart from their stone, of course. In the case of dogs and cats with heart or kidney disease, the simple answer is we don't know for sure. So in the case of kidney disease, some of these studies included, in hindsight, older animals that maybe had a degree of kidney dysfunction. One of the studies showed that the high sodium diet had absolutely no negative effects. One study showed that there were possibly some negative effects, although they did vary over time and it wasn't very clear. And I'd say overall, stay away from high sodium diets if an animal has kidney disease or heart disease because we simply do not know. And if you think about the theory, then it could be harmful. So a second misconception is something that um, is also derived actually from humans. So if you have humans with calcium stones, they often are told to decrease the salt in their diet. And the reason that they need to do that is because with an increase in dietary sodium, there's an increase in urinary calcium excretion. So the kidneys will excrete more of the calcium into the urine. So people say, well, but if you, if you increase the sodium in this dry food, then they'll start excreting more calcium. And, you know, isn't that going to increase the risk of the calcium oxalate stones? But actually it isn't, because the increase in sodium also increases the drinking and dilutes the urine. So overall, this calcium that is excreted will literally be diluted, yeah? So overall, studies have shown that there is a decrease in urinary calcium concentration, and that is what matters for the stone formation, if you feed a high sodium diet. And this is again from the famous study that I've been using throughout the entire lecture with the four different sodium levels in the diet. So the one on the right is the highest sodium diet, and you can see that the calcium concentration actually decreases over time. The second one would be pH and calcium oxalate, another common misconception in RSS, because people were saying, oh, we've seen a decrease in struvite stones since all these acidifying diets came on the market, and boom, there were the calcium oxalate stones. And people were saying initially, maybe we were causing these calcium oxalate stones with the diets. Um, and, and that would, of course, be a worry, because you wouldn't want to do that. But this is data from our kennel and cattery, so this is hundreds of data points. And what you can see here is you have the pH, you have the pH on the x-axis, and the calcium oxalate RSS on the y-axis. And remember that we said an R squared under 0.7, you just probably laugh it away. Well, the R squared for both dogs and cats, in this case, is even below 0.1. There's absolutely no correlation. And if you think about this boom in calcium oxalate that is happening, you can think of many other reasons why um, we are more aware of stone disease. We have become a lot better at doing imaging. Um, there are environmental risk factors that we may not know about. We still don't completely understand why and how calcium oxalate stones form. Um, the microbiome could be involved. You know, we were talking about uh, oxalobacter in the gut previously. So, what I'm trying to show with this graph is the diets are not causing the increase in calcium oxalate stones, and we need to find out what it is. And it could simply just be perception, or it could be a change in circumstances. So now the other methods to assess stone risk. Um, Equal2 is a software that is very similar to SuperSat, what we use at Royal Canin. And, um, it works exactly the same. You feed a diet, you collect the urine, you measure all these different solvents, and then the software will calculate the risk of stone formation for you. And in the case of calcium oxalate, SuperSat and Equal will give you sort of the same answer. 
In the case of struvite, they differ quite a lot. And in this study, what was done was actually they took dog urine and cat urine and human urine and a normal a normal solution to dissolve crystals in to try and reach a saturation value of one, yeah? So to try and reach that iced tea level of saturation. And then they measured all the different solvents in the urine and they plugged them in. And for SuperSat, the values are pretty close to one for all of them, so it's doing what it should be doing. And the variations that you can see there mean that there may be some interactions that SuperSat is missing, but it's not many. For Equal, the values are a lot higher um, than one, which means that Equal, in the case of struvite, for dogs and cats in particular, may not give the best representation of stone risk. Another method, which is uh, quite a nice one because theoretically you would be able to do it in your clinic, would be the calcium oxalate titration test. So this is a test that was based on the human bond risk index, and it can only measure the risk of calcium oxalate. And what it relies on is on gradual addition of oxalate to a urine sample. And in this urine sample you measure the calcium concentration, and then you measure how much oxalate you have added until Precipitation, so this cloudiness that you see in the bottom picture, occurs. And this means that you know, you're dealing with a whole urine sample. There's more than just ions interacting with one another. So RSS misses out on some organic promoters and inhibitors, some proteins that may be floating around affecting stone risk. This method takes those promoters into account. So it could theoretically be more telling on an individual basis, but on a group basis at the moment, first of all, we don't have a reference range, so it's tricky to interpret. Um, and to do this test, the urine still needs filtering, so some of these promoters or inhibitors may still re be removed from the urine. And also, the urine needs to stay warm to make this test um, trustworthy. And imagine an owner bringing in a urine sample. The urine sample is hardly ever warm. Yeah, They go outside with a kidney dish and they catch some of the urine for you and it's snowing so they come back in and there's snow in the urine and it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. But maybe in the future this can be developed towards something better. The last one would be the activity product ratio, which was developed in the 1970s. And um, I'll do this really quickly because I'm almost out of time. But what this relies on is a measurement of RSS, adding salts to seed precipitation, and 48 hours later, measuring RSS again. And um, the calculations can be performed for all the different types of crystals and stones. But I wonder about the clinical relevance, because even though it would take into account anything that is already present in the bladder and how that would affect the RSS value when it's in the bladder for a while, urine is never in the bladder for 48 hours. So to summarize, stone risk evaluation is really important in nutrition. RSS is a validated method. But of course, like every method, it has its downsides. It's done in healthy animals. It doesn't take organic promoters and inhibitors into account, but it's pretty good. Other methods that are out there, the calcium oxalate titration test, the activity product ratio, all with their pros and cons. Ways to lower RSS or ways to lower the stone risk with diet would be to increase the moisture in the food, to increase the sodium intake, to decrease the pH in the case of struvite, and to use targeted dietary minerals and precursors. And very important takeaway messages are high sodium diets are not dangerous for healthy animals, but you should definitely avoid them in animals with heart disease or kidney disease. And high sodium diets also do not increase the risk of calcium oxalate. So that was it.